Thank you so much for coming out, mashallah, for family night. It's such an honor to be invited, and I'm really excited to be discussing a topic that's very near and dear to my heart and very passionate about it as a mother, as a fellow Muslim, and also as a teacher to young children. So I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, Sheikh Faraz Rabani, who many of you may know from the Seekers Guidance website, He's, he's the creator of that website. He's a prominent scholar in Canada. He once was visiting us here in Northern California and at Intree, and we asked him, what should we be teaching our children? What's the most important thing that you think we should be teaching our children? And his response was, adab and akhlaq, manners and etiquettes. Parents don't emphasize these enough anymore. And then he went on to define adab as the appropriate action attitude and response in any given situation. So once again, adab is the appropriate action, attitude, and response in any given situation. Another scholar once said, adab beautifies everything it touches. We have Muslims who know rules and rituals. We don't have nearly enough Muslims who know how to have adab. Sell your misbaha, your prayer beads, and go buy some other instead. Of course, he said that tongue in cheek, but it was a deep point. Sell your misbaha and go buy some other instead. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, stated, I have only been sent to perfect good manners. I have only been sent to perfect good manners. And the fact that he said that he had been sent to perfect good manners indicates that good manners already existed in the world. Different cultures, cultures, different religions, different peoples, all can have good manners, but the Prophet came to perfect good manners. He came to bring it to the next level, mashallah. And another hadith of his that really touches me is when he told Aisha Rabbi Allah, show, oh Aisha, show gentleness, for if gentleness is found in anything, it beautifies it. And when it is taken out from anything, it damages it. My own son once asked a scholar whose company he was sitting in, he said, tell me, give me some advice. What would you, he was, I think, in college, he was in high school, actually. He asked the scholar, give me some advice. What do you think a young man of my age needs to know? It's a valuable piece of advice that you can give me. And the scholar said to him, have a dub. That's it. Learn adab and have adab. And he said, you don't even need a lot of adab. He said, we're, unfortunately, we're living in a time and age where if you have even a little bit of adab, he said, you'll go far in life and you'll win people's hearts. So I just wanted to share those quotes to um, emphasize the importance of adab in our religious tradition and why we should be teaching it not only to ourselves, but to our children as well. So I was at a friend's house who has five sons, mashallah. And while I was at her house, I saw this book on one of the tables. And if you have a pen and paper or pencil and paper, you can take notes. I will be giving the titles. But afterwards, those of you with smartphones can come up and take pictures of all the books that I have if you want to add them to your library. Anyway, this book is called How to Raise a Gentleman. And it's by an author named Kay West. And the book is still available on Amazon. Her last name is spelled W-E-S-T. Her first name is K, K-A-Y. How to Raise a Gentleman. And so I asked my friend, I said, what's this? And she said, oh, that, that's just something I'm going through to make sure that nothing falls through the cracks is all. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. A, a book that can help us learn what kind of other we should be teaching our young men. So sign me up. So I got the book and I went through it. Different people, different parents have used this book in different ways. Some give it to their children who are older to just read on their own. Some go through it as a family. Both parents go through it with their children. And um, some just read from it and decide to take out the points that they think are important and teach it to their children. So I went through this book, and I'll just give an example. There is a chapter in here, and it, it's a great book because it, you, think, you may think you know what you need to teach your children, but there's lots of little uh, subtle things that we may forget that are included in, in this book. And she has a book uh, about raising young women as well. It's called How to Raise a Lady. And I had ordered it for my talk tonight, but unfortunately Amazon says it's coming on Monday instead of today. So How to Raise a Lady by Kay West, and How to Raise a Gentleman by Kay West. 
Anyway, one of the chapters in this book covered um, what to do, how to be a good host and a good guest when you're at a sleepover, when you're spending the night at a friend's house or a relative's house. And so I went through that, and one of the points she covers, and at the end of each chapter, she has a checklist for you to go through to make sure you've covered all the points with your children. And one of the things she covered is what to do if you have a guest who's spending the night in your home and they wet the bed in the middle of the night, and what that might feel like and how you as a host should respond. And I covered that with my sons and then forgot about it. And believe it or not, a couple of months later, they had a friend over spending the night and that situation happened where the friend had an accident. And alhamdulillah, um, the kids knew what to do. But they knew exactly how to respond, how not to freak out, how to make the friend feel comfortable, how to take care of the situation discreetly. And it was something I would not have covered with them on my own. It's not something I had thought of. So that's just an example of the types of things that are covered in these books. So how to raise a gentleman, how to raise a lady, like your rest. Another book that I feel every Muslim should have in their library, very, very important book to have. It's an excellent read, very easy to go through. Um, this is, again, a book you can go through as a family with your children, or you can read it on your own. We went through this as a family, but then my sons also went through this with their Islamic studies teacher at the country. It's called Islamic Manners. It's by Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Bakr. This is also available on Amazon. The last name is spelled A-B-U space G-H-U-D-D-A-H. A-B-U space G-H-U-D-D-A-H. And the book is called Islamic Manners. And this book covers everything from a Muslim perspective about how you should be when you are um, sitting with two people, how you should be when you're sitting with one person how you should be when you're sitting with a group, um, how you should be a good host, how you should be a good guest, um, how you should give condolences when somebody gets bad news, how you should visit the sick. It goes to the other of eating and drinking. It goes to the other with one's parents. Um, how to be with your teachers. Mashallah, it covers a lot. And, it's, and as a parent, you will end up learning a lot for yourself as well. So mashallah, good book to have. Another book, which again, Amazon has not delivered to me yet, it's a book I lent out to somebody, so I don't have it yet myself, but at home. But it is called The Content of Character, and many people here may already have it. It's a book written, it's a compilation of 40 hadiths that are just about having good character, the different elements of good character that a Muslim should have. And the scholar who collected those 40 hadiths, his last name, I believe, is called Mazrui, M-A-Z-R-U-I. But what you need to know is that it was translated into English by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf Hansen. So when you look for it on Amazon, look for content of character, translated by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf Hansen. And that's a book worth going to through. But this book is a book I love with my children that we used. Um, it's called The Content of Character Copy Book. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's sister created this. It's a workbook that has each of the hadiths in it in English. And then it's here in Arabic as well. So when we were homeschooling our children at home for dictation exercises, we would have them write the hadith in English and then they would practice it practice writing it in Arabic. And then in their Islamic studies class later on, their teacher had them actually memorize a number of the hadiths. An example of one of these is the Messenger of God said, God does not regard your externals or your riches, but rather your hearts and your deeds. So all the things, um, the Messenger of God said, the most rewarding, the most rewarding visitation of the sick is the one that is appropriately brief. Right? So when you go to visit people who are ill, you just stay for a little while, wish them well, do the well for them, and then you move on. So the 40 at least in this book, the content of character will cover all the things you need to know about Hadar and Shana. Okay, and then this is a picture book that I loved when my kids were little. Uh, it's called My Mum is a Wonder. And it's not mom, it's mum, M-U-M, because it's uh, published in India. And it's by Michelle Masindi. It's still available on Amazon. My mom is a wonder, and I love this book because it's a picture book, and a very sweet picture book of a 
little boy observing his mother throughout the day. If he wakes up in the morning and sees that his mother is already up reading the Quran on her prayer mat. Um, and then it follows along throughout the day and the boy's different observations of her, how she takes care of him, how she serves the family, how she likes to garden, how she goes to visit the sick, um, and teaches him about his religion and whatnot. But the reason I wanted to bring up this book is because I remember uh, recommending this book to a friend of mine, a, a mother that I really, really admire a lot, which, you know, the way she's raised her children. And she liked the book, but she said, yeah, I'm not going to be reading it to my children. Yeah. And I was kind of surprised. I was like, why wouldn't you want to read this book to your kids? It's a great book. And she said, because I don't embody the things in here that the mother does. So I would feel like a hypocrite reading it to my children and telling them that this is what we're supposed to be like, that this is what a mother's supposed to be like, but I'm not doing these things. She said, inshallah, I'm going to try and inculcate the good qualities of this mother in this book. And once, inshallah, I'm practicing those things, then I'll start preaching about it. That is a very, very important point about other, because many of us with our children, we tend, and I include myself in this, we tend to be, do as I say, not as I do, right? But as Estadaranya said, uh, she said, children listen with their eyes. Children listen with their eyes. So they're like sponges, and they are completely absorbing um, what their parents are doing and what's going on around them. And then when they're squeezed, that's what comes out of them. And so now that we've defined the adab and the importance of it, the, probably the most important point is that Learning other is the hugest lesson is really for ourselves. And the most growth and inshallah, the most improvement that we're going to see in our lives is going to be inshallah when we're working on ourselves first and then our children will learn inshallah. Okay, so I wrote an article for this column called Raising Our Ummah by Muslim Matter, Muslim Matters. And the article was called Raising the Muslim with Manners. And that's the article I'm going to cover today. So in that article, I broke up the five different areas that I feel, um, or I've been told, are kind of important to cover with children. And it can be really overwhelming as parents to think, like, where do I even start? Where do I even begin? So if we can break it into maybe subcategories and think about, okay, these are the things I want to get my kids and make sure that they're getting them, it can feel a little bit more manageable and a little bit more doable. So let me make sure. Okay. okay, so before I go into it, I wanted to again just remind ourselves about the Hadith of uh, Ali Allahu Anhu, where he said about children, he said, play with them for the first seven years, so zero to seven, play with them for the first seven years, teach them for the second seven years, so seven to 14 years, teach them. And then be their friend for the third seven years. So 14 to 21, be their friend. Meaning that you, know, you respect their opinion, you're not authoritarian over them, you consult with them, you advise them, you, you respect their boundaries, you treat them like a friend. And then he said after that, you let them go. And inshallah, they'll be successful. And um, that advice that Hazrat Ali in the Allah who gave is completely in line with modern psychology, what people know about children, what the experts now today know about children. But the first seven years are really about just leaving them alone, um, letting them play, letting them just kind of absorb their surroundings around them and see the routine and see what your nature is in the home. But then seven to 14 years are the most crucial years. Those are the years to teach them everything you really want to get into them. Um, and just fill their minds and fill their surroundings with what you want so that your voice is in their head so that after they leave the age of 14, they, inshallah, will have your voice back in the background and um, reminding them of the difference between right and wrong. My husband and I found that after the age of 14, it's really hard to start teaching anything new and start implementing anything new. At, after age 14, you're you're really just maintaining whatever you've been teaching up until then, or whatever changes the kids make in their lives, they make it because they want to make it, because they're inspired by either a teacher or a friend or you or whoever, but it's not because you as a parent are saying, okay, this is what we need to do now. After 14, it's very hard to, to start making those changes in your life. So those of you who have kids between 7 and 14, use that time wisely, and if your kids are older than 14, don't lose hope. 
despair. We can never despair. We can never lose hope. And all of us upon it, all of us are one of us in charge. And there's nothing more powerful than a parent's prayers. So you keep praying for your kids. And you keep. Yeah, Maya Angelou has a great quote. She said, when you know better, you do better. Right? When you know better, you do better. So when you learn something new or you know something better, you start doing it. And each other your kids will see that you too are on this journey in life of trying to improve. Okay, so um, for this article, I have interviewed parents who are very, very successful with their children, but from what it looked like to all of us with the children's outlet, mashallah, I kind of asked them what they felt were the most important things to cover with their kids. So the first thing um, many parents talked about was personal grooming and hygiene. So teaching the kids about the other uh, personal grooming and hygiene. So um, one of the things we did in our home is that um, we made it a routine that on Fridays was the day that we cut our nails because that's the sunnah of Jalan anyway. And this way, if you have your kids in the routine and the habit of cutting their nails on Fridays, then you don't have to nag them, inshallah, the rest of the time. Like, oh, your nails are too long, and why haven't you cut your nails, or your nails are dirty, like that constant nagging that parents have to do with their kids. Friday, if it's part of the Friday routine, um, then inshallah, that's one thing that can get checked off. We also taught our children that angels are attractive to good sense, um, S-C-E-N-T-S, sense, and that, you know, for, for boys, obviously for women it's a different ruling, but for boys we told them that, you know, that's one thing you're not going to be held accountable for, however much money you decide to spend on perfumes and cologne and food, um, you're not held accountable for that, Islamically, because good sense and perfumes on men especially is considered to be a sadaqa, and it's a charity to people around you, and so you're actually rewarded for it. Um, we, when the kids were younger, it's really important to help set your kids up for success. So we created for our kids grooming kits. So we got them each their own little case, and uh, actually not such a little case, bigger case, but in that case we put all the travel-sized toilet keys that you could need. Toothpaste, mouthwash, floss, you know, um, when they were older, razor, nail cutters, they always had their own set of nail cutters so that they didn't have that excuse that I couldn't find the nail cutter so I couldn't cut my nails. Um, you know, deodorant, all the different things that you can get at Target or any of the pharmacies. And we would keep them in their grooming kits. And so when they went to go spend the night at a friend's house or they had to go stay with relatives, all they had to do was just grab that grooming kit and go and they had everything that they needed. When the boys were older, um, and this, also girls, obviously, I don't have daughters, but this is a uh, really important for parents and girls to know. It's important to have the talk of the core puberty about personal grooming and hygiene. Um, if you're not comfortable giving that talk, then it's important that you get somebody that you respect and trust, and who your children respect and trust, who can give them that talk about how they need to be taking care of their uh, personal grooming and hygiene. And um, don't assume that your kids are going to figure it out, figure it out, or are going to know what to do. This is all stuff that they need to be trained in. They need to be taught through it. Um, on Jama, also uh, obviously fresh clothes for Jama. If they bought new clothes, tell them let's save it for Jama because it's it's a similar to the new clothes on Jama. Uh, making sure that when they come to Friday prayers, they're not coming with clothing that's yet or dirty. This is all part of the other of um, personal training and hygiene. Also, when they, you're te potty training them, uh, along with teaching them the du'as of entering and leaving the restroom, teaching them how to use the isbanja hand or the Muslim shower, teaching them which hand to use for what and how to make sure they're not contaminating the bathroom with the dirty hand, you know, not washing themselves with their left hand and then using the left hand to turn off the faucet or turning the doorknobs with that teaching them which hand to use where, in what, in what order. One little uh, tip of uh, that, that uh, young lady told me that I thought was really nice, she said that her mother taught her and her siblings that when you're done using this ganja can, which in Urdu we call Lorka, it's the can that you have next to the toilet for the water, she said that their mother taught them that after you're done using it, you fill it with water again and leave it for the next person. So that the next person who comes and uses the restroom doesn't have to get up. It's just a 
So consider it going to do as well. I thought that was nice. Um, a mother is obviously teaching their daughters how to dispose of them and hygiene product, products in a discreet manner. So that um, there's nothing embarrassing or disgusting in the bathroom. Okay. The second area that we covered was how to be a good guest. So what are the etiquettes of how to be a good guest in somebody else's home? So when your kids are going to visit somebody else and you're not going to be with them, or if they're going to spend the night in someone's home and you're not going to be with them, it's, a, it's important to go through a checklist with them and just review with them what the above expectations are. Again, don't assume that they're going to know what to do or they'll figure it out. Um, you want to keep your instructions short and simple so that they're not overwhelmed. But there are a few basic instructions that every child should know before they go to somebody else's home, and especially if they're spending the night. Make your bed in the morning or fold up your bedding if you have to go out on the carpet to the best of your ability. It doesn't have to be perfect, but your host needs to see that you made an effort to make your bed and didn't leave it a mess. Close the toilet lid after you're done using it. Dry the counter after you're done using the restroom. Um, one other, by the way, of the bathroom that a scholar told us is he told us that traditionally the area where you did the do was separate from the area where you used the toilet. Right? Traditionally, in Muslim homes, Muslim bathrooms, those areas were separate. And because the do is considered to be an act of ibadah, um, traditionally, you wouldn't be doing it in an area where you're urinating or defecating. So now a lot of bathrooms, obviously the toilet is right near the sink. So he said at the very minimum, in order to have that other in your mind, close the toilet lid. So that when you do you do, at least the toilet uh, is closed. Either wash your dishes, put them in the dishwasher, or place them in the sink after you're done with your meal. Depending on whatever your host prefers, but do take care of your dishes once you're done eating. Don't just walk away from the table expecting others to pick up after you. Compliment the chef. Even if it wasn't your favorite meal, you don't have to lie. But you, can, you can tell the chef that you noticed they put in an effort or you can thank them for feeding you. Clean up your games and toys after you're done playing. Don't open, this is a really important thing. Don't open closed doors, cabinets, closets, drawers. Ask for whatever you need. Don't go searching on your own. So if your child is spending the night at someone's home and they realize they forgot their toothpaste that they usually have in their toilet toothpaste, they shouldn't be opening the doors in the person's bathroom trying to find the toothpaste. They should just ask the host. Same goes with uh, going into people's private bedrooms, especially the parents' bedrooms. I still remember when my boy, my eldest son was little, he uh, had a friend over and they were playing hide and seek, hide, hide and go seek. And they were running through the house and they were hiding and they were chasing each other. And my son ran into my bedroom to hide. And I still remember his friend came running after him and he came screeching to a stop at my bedroom door, like as if there was this invisible force field that he had slammed into and he stopped. And he said, John, I need you to come outside and play in the lock. I'm not allowed to enter parents' bedrooms. And I was very impressed. He was like a seven-year-old boy, inshallah. And so that, that was something, obviously, his parents had taught him that you don't go into parents' bedrooms, especially if not without permission. Um, notice what chores your friends help with and offer your assistance as soon as possible. So if you notice that your friend is responsible for clearing the table after dinner, you help clear the table. If you notice that it's their job to unload the dishwasher, you get up and help unload the dishwasher. You don't just sit there on the couch waiting for your friend to be free to play with you, right? You get up and you're, you're part of the family helping. All right, the third thing parents told me they covered with their kids is how to be a gracious host. So when someone is visiting you, is in your home, how do you take care of them? So one thing that's important to teach our children, and kids don't learn this overnight, so if you feel that you've told your kids, you've told them once, you've told them twice, you've told them three times, and they're still not getting it, don't lose heart. These, uh, it, it's, it's like 
It's like when, you know, bamboo grows, it's like this consistent little drip of water, and then all of a sudden bamboo grows overnight. That, that's what's going to happen. It's like you're getting your voice into your kids' heads, and then you'll be surprised that it'll come out when they're on their own or when they're going to be child. But it's our job as parents to consistently teach them and not give up. So um, one of the things we have to teach our kids is how to be conversationalists, right? Like one time, I remember hearing one of my sons, I heard an uncle in the community talking to him. And I overheard the conversation. And I heard the uncle talking to him, and he was asking my son questions about different things, like, do you like this, do you do that, whatever. And my son kept answering his questions politely, but they were just yes or no responses. He would just answer the question and then done. Like he didn't leave like a window open for the conversation to go further. And so later I took him aside and I told him that you know that uncle was trying to talk to you, he was trying to have a conversation with you. And part of being a charming conversationalist is for you to make the other person feel like you're interested in them. And so even if you can't think of what else to talk about after you've answered their question, if people always feel honored and respected when you show interest in them. So you don't have to be nosy, you don't have to ask a lot of nosy questions, but you can ask general questions like, you know, so Uncle, how do you like California? How are you enjoying the weather here? What's been your favorite thing to do? Or how old are your kids? How are they like in school? Whatever. You can you can ask questions about another person to show that you two are interested in going to know them. Um, all right, so shyness and modesty are qualities that are beautiful, and they are qualities that we should respect and we should honor those qualities in our children. The prophet's love is someone that's a shy and modest person. Um, and we live in a culture where it seems like the only people who are praised are the ones who have a lot of confidence and don't like being in the spotlight and speak in front of everyone. But shyness and modesty are beautiful qualities that should be honored. Having said that, shyness and modesty should not extend so far that children cannot say salams, right? So when that should be a non-negotiable. That should be taught from a young age to our children. That I understand you're shy, I understand you're modest. You don't have to hug people, you don't have to kiss people, that's not required of you. You don't even have to shake hands. You're allowed to have your physical boundaries. However, as a Muslim, when somebody says salams to you, you're required. Muslim to respond. So that needs to be a non-negotiable that every parent should teach their children and should role model for them and should practice with them at home so that you're not in that uncomfortable situation in public where you're begging your child to say salams to people and they're refusing. Right? So and of course nobody's judging anybody. This is something that gradually children learn, but as parents it's our job to teach our kids. Inshallah to just smile and say one from salam. The other thing that entails good other is that when, when somebody says salams, you say one in Islam, you don't say hi. You don't say hey or hello or good morning. You say salams. Okay, some other uh, other tips that were beautiful is um, when people are staying in your home, a good rule of thumb is to think about what a bellhop would do in a hotel for guests, right? How do the bellhops or the concierges take care of guests in hotels, and in nice hotels? So those were the, that was kind of the litmus test that we tried to have for our children to learn how to treat our guests. Mashallah, we get a lot of house guests here in Northern California. So some of those things are helping your guests bring in their luggage, right? They don't carry their own bags in, making sure they have a glass of water by their bed, Asking them if they need anything before they go to sleep. Uh, when it's time for them to leave, helping them with their luggage again, taking that out. Um, asking them if they slept well, if they're enjoying their stay. These are all parts of being little tips of being a good host. And the, probably the most important one, when you're sitting in company, put away your laptop, put away your phone, put away your iPad, whatever device you have that takes you away from the people in front of you and give your guests your full attention. If you need to respond to a text or an email, make it clear to your guest that you're aware and you're taking time away from them. Say, do you mind if I just respond to this text? It's time sensitive. Or please excuse me for a moment while I return this email. 
that I need to take care of today. And then come back, put your device away, and give your guests your full attention. If you need to be on your devices, distracted, then step away from the room. Don't be doing that in the company of people. This is basic, basic about that all children and adults, ourselves as well, we need to learn. One um, other, and again, like I said in the beginning, we're all learning, right? As adults, we're all learning. Um, one other that I didn't know, I wasn't aware of, and that I learned only a few years ago, is we have a family friend here in San Ramon, who one thing, he's been raised beautifully, mashallah, he practices, it feels like practices all the same. And one thing I noticed about him is any time we visited him, and I'm sure most people here probably do this, but unfortunately we did not used to do this in my family, um, anytime we visited him and he left, whether it was me alone, whether it was me and my child, whether it was our entire family, he always made a point of walking us to our car. If it was me by myself, he would walk to my car with his wife. If it was me with my children, he would grab his children who are the same ages and walk with them right to the car. And when it was our whole family, it would be by himself or him and his whole family, but they would always walk us to our car. And I did not know that that's based on a hadith. That there's a hadith where the Prophet said, walk your guests to their riding beasts, right? At that time, camels and donkeys and horses. But now it's cars and bicycles and motorcycles, whatever, however, the Uber, whatever your guest came in, how they're leaving, a good guest, a good Muslim guest, walks their guest to their transport, or to their mode of transportation. We used to walk our guests to the door, thank them for coming, give them a warm goodbye, say salams, stand at the door while they left, and then close the door and go inside. Now, that actually feels horrible when we think about it, but that's what we used to do. Now, we don't wear shoes in our home, but we keep a pair of shoes by the front door, and one of us, if not all of us, walks our guests to um, the park. And that's a sunnah. And so if you make the intention that you're doing a sunnah, you inshallah get the, get the reward of Ibana. Okay, the fourth um, category that we're going to talk to their kids is about how to be a kind and considerate friend. So, as parents, it's our job to teach our kids how to be a good friend and how to fulfill the rights that their friends actually have over them. It's a big responsibility to be a friend. And that's why there are many people I know who don't take on too many close friends because they know friends have a lot of rights over them. It can be overwhelming to fulfill all these rights. So you want to do a good job as a friend, um, taking care of one another. So part of learning manners and etiquettes is knowing that you're never allowed to backbite your buddies. Backbiting would be saying in their absence that which they wouldn't like to hear in their presence. That you must always return any items you borrowed in exactly the condition you received them in. And if you break something or lose something, you either replace it or compensate them. Right? So kids should know that. They should know the rules of what it means to borrow something from somebody. And that you must be willing to pick up the phone and call with your congratulations when someone dear to you receives good news and with your condolences when someone close to you is dealing with bad news. A few years ago, we had a health scare with one of our sons and we were waiting on some test results from the doctor and we were pretty stressed out, really worried about what those test results were going to reveal. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, and his manatala spared us, and he's fine. Um, however, a few of my close friends, uh, close family friends, knew what we were going through. And I remember being very, very touched when my son's friend, the son of one of my friends, who's also my son's friend, but he was young, he was young at the time, and he made a point of calling my son Asking him how he was feeling, telling him that he was being poor well for him, and reassuring him that he would be fine with children, and telling him my whole family was doing well for him. That was a, a beautiful act of friendship, and it's something that our children, inshallah, should see us doing for our friends, and then inshallah, they should also do continue that in their own relationships. And then I know of a Somebody who told me she was very touched when her son got into a very prestigious university and we were really excited. And her son's friend called and talked to everybody in the family, congratulated all of them, congratulated the parents, congratulated the siblings about the son. And the 
good university in Australia. Okay, so we have to teach our kids that above entails having a healthy, sensitive understanding of how people around you are feeling, and then responding appropriately to those feelings. So one of our favorite quotes is from the author Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift is the author of the book, Gulliver's Travels. This is a great quote. A friend of mine liked it so much that she had it stitched on a cushion. Good manners is the art of making people comfortable. Whoever makes the fewest people uncomfortable has the best manners. Good manners is the art of making people comfortable. Whoever makes the fewest people uncomfortable has the best manners. All right, and then the last category to cover with our kids, inshallah, is being a model student. So I know a lot of our kids who went through home tree um, when they and some of them entered public high school, one of the things that one of the things that really surprised uh, the kids who have been homeschooled their whole lives or who have been part of the home tree homeschooling co op, one of the things that surprised them in public high school was really the lack of other that students have with teachers. Um, you know, backbiting about teachers, making fun of teachers, interrupting them, um, not seeing their needs and, and responding to them and helping teachers carry their things when they have a heavy load. Uh, that was kind of surprising. And so these are things as, as Muslims, our children should be taught from a young age. And there's many opportunities to teach them. First and foremost, foremost Juma. When our kids come for Juma prayers, inshallah, with us, they should learn. And there's some subtle... Um, other other tips in our doing. One is that you don't sit with your feet pointing towards the teacher or the khati, right? Um, your feet should be either under you or across or folded, but not stretched out so that they're facing towards whoever is um, giving the khutbah or the dars or the, the lecture or the talk. Um, another thing is if you're coming to a lecture or to a talk, teaching your children to have a notebook and pen with them. So that the person who is taking the time out to speak feels like, okay, what I'm sharing has value. People are actually interested in it and people are taking notes. So that's um, a good tip for students to learn. Um, reading elders first, not interrupting or talking um, when they're talking. Waiting until the end to ask your questions. Um, let's see. Again, never joking or making fun, but never joking at the expense of teachers or making fun of them or imitating them. Okay, so those were the five categories I wanted to cover. Um, let me just see if there was anything else. Oh, like I'll give you a little, little example. That, that same dad who, from whom I learned that we should always be walking our guests to the club, he was an old tree father. And one year at Elm Tree, our, stu our student council, the students used to decide different events for the kids to get to do. And one year, the students did a pajama day. And uh, so everybody was really excited. And the kids came to school dressed in their pajamas and their nightgowns and their bathrobes. And the te some of us teachers did as well. And this dad <laughs> arrived at Elm Tree and he was just he was horrified when he saw everybody there in his pajamas and he had, he took me aside. I was one of the managers at the time. And he was like, Whose idea was this? How, how did, and I was like, Oh, it's something that you know they do in public schools and the kids were excited and they have like a character day and uh, twins day and today's pajama day. So he very gently explained to me that coming to school in your pajamas is like the ultimate bad that above towards education. And that education, the, the topic of learning is a, is a sacred topic. It's, it's uh, something that's so encouraged in our being. And to wear your worst clothes, the clothes you don't want anyone in public to ever see you in, the clothes you wear when you're getting in your bed in the privacy of, your, of the night, to wear that out in public when you're coming to school or you mind, like what message is that that we're teaching our children? And subhanAllah, I had never even thought of it from that perspective. And he's absolutely right. And so we discussed it with the kids, and they understood. We understood. We all learned together. 
And then the Java day was never repeated again, I'm sure, yeah, to the best of my knowledge. Um, some people take other to such a high level when it comes to learning that they are also, they are, um, well, some people don't react well to this because they think it's extreme. I'm not saying to do this. I'm just giving an example of how some people, how they, how, what level their event is at when it comes to education. Some people won't even throw away pens. They won't throw them away. They'll bury them because uh, a less kind of fellow swears by the pen. So out of other for knowledge and for the pen, they, they won't throw it in the garbage. So I, uh, that's not me, I'm not there yet, unfortunately, but that's an example of, of what different levels of other can look like. Um, so I want to end with, I want to leave room and time for um, Q&A, but I just want to end with this conclusion. Um, what I found is that all the books and all the discussions and all the checklists are pointless unless manners and etiquettes are actually actively being modeled for our young ones. Like I said before, kids are like sponges. They're soaking up everything around them. And when they're squeezed, whatever is inside comes gushing out. And there's a reason why people say his or her parents raised him or her well when they're commenting on somebody's beautiful, refined other. So it's up to us as parents to rise to the occasion and be whatever we want our kids to be in Shama. And in the process of trying to prepare the next generation to be more compassionate, more considerate than what the dominant culture around them is, then it's quite possible that we're going to improve our own worlds as well. Inshallah, because the most growth and the most improvement that will come in our own lives is when we're kind of learning so that we can tell them and pass that on to our children. And those of us here who are connected to a different culture, a culture from back home, um, there's a lot to take from the culture of our parents that is beautiful that we should be passing on to our children because, um, you know, a lot of it, unfortunately, is not here. There, there is a lot of good in the Western culture as well, like being on time and not littering and, you know, being ethical about paying your bills and civic responsibilities, those are all beautiful acts of other that we should be taking uh, that was taught in our religion as well, but many of our cultures, unfortunately, we don't emphasize them enough. Um, but there's a lot of beauty in the other of our cultures back home that should be emulated and taught to the next generation here as well. And Dr. Leonard Sachs, by the way, who's a child psychologist who's written a lot of wonderful books about parenting that I recommend. His last name is called SAX. Dr. Leonard Sachs, highly recommend all his books. He said that if you speak another language, be sure to speak it to your children and to teach your children that language because the other languages from back home naturally have other built into that. And we all know that, right? The difference in how to speak to elders and youngsters, that's, that's in the Spanish culture, that's in our culture as well. You know, but unfortunately, that's not here in the, in the West. So, okay, I'm going to end there. And if anybody has questions, suggestions, ideas, observations, we'd love to hear it. And I'll, I'll see if I can repeat it because they're live streaming the talk. And if anybody's watching online, I'd love to hear questions there as well. Any questions out there or comments? How to install it? Okay, so the question is after the age of 14, how to install it for a few minutes? Um, I mean, I can, I can only tell you what we said in our home. It was just, this is the time you need to be home. Like, it wasn't an argument. It wasn't a discussion. Like, if they wanted that privilege of being able to go out and see their friends, um, whatever curfew. I mean, if, if kids are not, are not obeying or respecting what your curfew limits are, then they lose those privileges. It's as simple as that. There has to be an agreement between parent and child, right? 
how things are going to run in the home, and what the expectations are, and what the rules are. It's important to have those discussions with your kids, especially at the age of 14. One thing that um, we did for a while that worked well um, is to have family meetings once a week. And instead of nagging the kids all week about different things that need to get done or different things you expect of them, just making a note of the things you want to cover. And then having a family meet meeting where everybody is there. Because as the kids get older, everybody has busy schedules and they're running in different directions. But making sure that family meeting time is, is a priority. And sitting down and talking about what the expectations are, what the needs are, if there's certain chores that need to be taken care of. And also including fun things like, oh, these are some fun plans that are coming up. I want to make sure you guys all know about it, put it on your calendar. So along with all the fun stuff, also talking about some of the hard stuff, you know, the, do we need to revisit it? Maybe, maybe our curfew is way too strict. Let's talk about it. You know, what, what, what is it that you feel you need? And then you see if that's reasonable or not, and where you're willing to bend. But um, the parents are the authority figures as long as your children are living in your home, and you do, and you're paying the bills, and, and you're the parents. And so if you have a, a time limit, it should be expected that the kids are. Um, I'm sorry, but was it more helpful than that? I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you get this? Anybody else? Any of the dads? Any of the kids? Are we going to wrap up? Nobody has anything to add? Come on. We can all learn from each other. <laughs> question is about how to navigate different relationships with people from other cultures and other religions that may not be in line with yours and how to stick to your own principles um, and be confident and unapologetic as Muslims. Yeah, one thing that, um, so always, of course, all parents do this, but do a lot of dua for your children to have wonderful, to be blessed with wonderful teachers and to be blessed with wonderful friends. So if they have good teachers and good friends from their religious tradition, then inshallah that will be their core group and they will learn a lot from them and then they'll be able to take that into the outside world. Um, as far as their relationships with people from other cultures and other religions, one thing that we all know is nobody likes to be lectured, nobody likes to be proselytized to, where like you lecture the person trying to tell them that your way is a better way. What speaks volumes is just setting an example and daring to be different. So encouraging our children, like one thing I told my kids when they went to high school, two of my kids went to public high school, one went to a private Islamic school, a private Islamic high school. Um, what I told them is I'm not afraid of other children being a bad influence on you. I'm afraid that you won't be a good influence on them. So the Prophet everywhere he went, he impacted people and influenced them for the better. And I hope that whatever circles you're entering in, that people will be affected by your presence and will want to try to be better. And without lecturing, obviously, just by setting a good example, right? So 
making sure the kids know the responsibility of what it means to be a foot Muslim, and, but letting them know that you don't expect them to go around lecturing people and making them feel bad. All you expect them to do is really to stick to their principles. And what I have seen is some kids may not get it, and some kids may even make fun of you, you know, uh, as Muslims, we're like the last religion standing that's still holding on to our, our beliefs, on to our principles. But there are people who do get affected. I've seen it again and again, even if they don't say it. And years later, they'll remember that Muslim kid that was in my class in high school who was different from other children. I know of one boy, uh, one Muslim boy who was going to a local high school here, and he never lectured anybody. He never told them what's right and wrong. He just stuck to his own principles. And for New Year's, the, his, the guys in his group of friends were talking about what their New Year's resolutions are going to be. And one kid said that my New Year's resolution is going to be to stop cussing, to stop swearing. And all the guys started laughing. They're like, you're not going to be able to do it. How are you going to give up cussing? Nobody can give up cussing. And he said, yeah, I can. He said, well, haven't you noticed this kid? And he pointed to the Muslim kid. And he said, haven't you noticed him? He never cusses. So if he can get away with never cussing, why can't I? Which is really interesting because the kid, the Muslim kid who didn't cuss, never told them don't cuss. Never told them, I don't want to hear that bad language. He himself just never used that bad language. And there were some people who noticed and were inspired by it. So if we can just, inshallah, instead of making our kids feel like we're afraid that they're going to get messed up, it, instead turning it around and say, turn it into, I'm afraid you're not going to pass on this beautiful legacy that our prophets and Lord and Son taught us. Right? You, you are from his ummah. And my worry is that you are going to bury that or you're going to hide it. And other people are not going to get to learn from that height that you carry within you. Making them really proud of, of who they are. Right? And what tradition they're carrying in life, inshallah. You know what? Yeah, most of the yeah, Muslims like especially kids, they see that you know it's hard. It's, it's very hard, hard. Yeah. and we have to have a lot of compassion for our children. A lot of compassion because it is hard being different. And it's hard always standing out and it's hard always saying, I can't do this and I can't do that, but everybody else around you is doing. And uh, one hadith that's very powerful, that is good to teach our children, is where the Prophet said, Islam began as a strange religion, and it will one day again become a strange religion. It salams to the strangers, right? The Prophet sent his salams on the strangers. And so, who are the strangers? The strangers are the ones who are strange. They're different. They're not... You know, that, that hadith was the hadith that inspired me to put on the hijab because I was really, really struggling and I didn't want to stand out. I didn't want to be different. And somebody told me that hadith and it really hit me because I was looking at all the women who wore hijab and thinking, oh, so the Prophet salams on them. But I'm not a stranger. I'm just fitting in with everybody. You know, like that's how I took it at that time. But yeah, just reminding our kids that we, we are the strangers and it's okay. It's okay. Everybody is becoming the same, unfortunately. And somebody has to be willing to show that there's a different way of doing things. Things are changing so quickly. What used to be wrong is now right. What used to be haram is now halal. Everywhere in our culture here, you know, and it's constantly changing. Like my eldest son, the difference between him and my youngest son is seven years, and they went to the same high school here in Sandoval. My eldest son was saying, 
the kids of the, his youngest brothers, they're at a completely different place in understanding of where his generation. Just in seven years, he could see such a big difference in, in what people think is okay, what's acceptable, what used to be considered unacceptable. So, yeah. So the question is about how to teach our children to be selfless because it's the nature of a lot of young people to be selfish and it, it's true that's just the age of life that kids are in where it's about me myself and my, my things, right? Me, myself, and I. And um, one, um, well, one thing I've seen is those children who have grandparents in the home, I, I've seen a big difference in the level of other of children who have grandparents in the home and children who don't have grandparents. I, my siblings and I grew up in Southern California. Uh, my dad is one of 10 siblings, mashallah. All of my cousins grew up in Pakistan, except for one of those kids. And uh, now all my cousins are in America, but the level of other that my cousins from Pakistan have compared to what my siblings and I have, it's, it's night and day. And it's because I know they grew up around grandparents and having to serve grandparents and take care of them. Those of us who don't have grandparents here to serve and take care of, um, help having our children think about how they can give back to the community. And they can, they can decide how they want to do it, but there should definitely be one category on their week that is about giving back. We, we talk to our kids about how there's six different categories in the week that they should be touching upon. Otherwise, it's very easy to start living an unbalanced life. So one category is your education. You have to be working on your studies. One category is your for earning money. You need to be figuring out when you're older like how you want to earn some pocket money. Um, or if you're doing an internship or something for your future career. Then the third category is your health. So taking care of your health, making sure you're getting exercise or going to the gym or doing something, learning a sport, something. So that's three. So the fourth was uh, something to do with your religion beyond the five prayers a day. So whether it's coming to uh, the Friday night program that used to happen at MCC or it's taking a fit class or it's taking a SIDA class or uh, it used to be going to Bali, something, choosing something for the religion that's beyond the just the real prayers and you put on. So where am I at right now? Four, four. So now we're on number five. Um, fifth was family. So you have to be giving time to the family. Because as I said before, when kids start getting older, especially in the teen years, it's really easy for everyone to just start running in different directions and we don't see each other for big spans of time. So making sure that you either have a family dinner a couple of times a week or you do Sunday morning brunch. Or I know one family where there are many siblings, the older sibling had to take spend time babysitting the younger siblings, something where you're giving back to the family. And then the sixth category is community, giving back to the community. And that's where service comes in, beyond just the family. So how can you give back to the community? There's all sorts of volunteer jobs in our different massages. Um, there's, uh, I, I know of an elderly couple that lived in San Ramon, and one of the kids in the neighborhood, his job was to go help the elderly uncle uh, file his paperwork because it was getting overwhelming for him and he wasn't able to do things properly. So this young man would go to his house and help him file his paperwork. But something where they're giving back and they're serving, and then they see that other people have needs, right? And then, of course, if they see your parents, inshallah, you know, making meals for people who are sick or helping a mother who just had a baby or going to sort through donations at MCC or helping give blood at, at uh, one of the blood banks, there's all sorts of volunteer opportunities that come up, but keeping an eye open for them and asking your kids, which volunteer opportunity do you want to take on? But definitely, there should be something that would back to the community. That's a good question. Any other questions?
all of the three parenting styles. So um, there's three styles of parenting. So everybody can take a moment and reflect on which style of parenting do I have. There's the style of parenting that is the authoritarian parenting, which is also called brick wall parenting. It's where the parent is like, it's my way or the highway, only my rules matter, you don't have any say, if you don't listen to me, you're going to get the back of my hand, you're going to get a spanking or a beating. That's authoritarian parenting. The second type of parenting is called permissive parenting. Um, it's also called jellyfish parenting. It's where the parents don't have a backbone. They're just always whining and complaining and talking about how their kids don't listen to them. They don't know what to do. And honey, why don't you listen to me? And, and you know, they, they tell their kid a rule. They say they're not allowed to do that. Uh, and they, the kid breaks the rule in front of them, right? They say, if you do that one more time, we're going to leave. If you do that one more time, we're going to leave. I'm telling you right now, if you do that one more time, we're going to leave. And then the kid does it one more time, and the parent doesn't leave. They just sit there saying, what do I do with this child? He never listens to me. That's called permissive parenting, um, jellyfish parenting. And the third type of parenting, which is considered to be the best form of parenting, is called authoritative parenting. And that's also called uh, backbone parenting. So there's brick wall, which is authoritarian, jellyfish, which is permissive, and then there's backbone, which is authoritative parenting. And that's where the parent says what they mean, and they mean what they say, they're respected as the authority figure in the home. The kids um, may not agree with all the parents' rules, but they feel respected. Um, they know how to talk so that their kids want to listen, inshallah, um, even if it's not always easy. And they listen so that the kids want to talk to them, inshallah, which also is not easy. So there is a really good book, uh, again, by Dr. Leonard Sachs, which can teach you how to be an authoritative parent. It's called The Collapse of Parenting. The Collapse of Parenting. So, and then there's another book called How to Talk So Your Kids. How to Talk So Your Kids Will Listen and Listen So Your Kids Will Talk. That's another good book. I think the last one, the author of the that is Harvard. That's a really good idea. How to Talk So Your Kids Will Listen How to Listen So Your Kids Will Talk. So we are now at an hour. I was supposed to speak for an hour, so I think so if there's no other questions, we can wrap it up and then everybody's been sitting for a while. Thank you. We'll just end with one answer. This sounds really excited for us. Thank you very much. Please keep my family and my husband. Please keep us all here in the last time.